participation well, on science that. communication uh, here at NYU for the spring, but we're mm -hmm. already working on some amazing additional uh, events for the fall, and uh, I'm excited about who we've lined up already, and there's, there's more to come. Uh, I'm Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of science journalism here at NYU and the director of the <coughs> science and health Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program uh, here at NYU. And uh, also the director of the Science Communication Workshops. Uh, and we love these events because we have both our journalists who are learning to be science journalists and our scientists who are learning to be better science communicators together, intermingling, which is just, just what we like to see. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to have such a, a wonderful uh, panel lined up for our final event of the, of the spring. Uh, Ann Gibbons and Ian Tattersall are wonderful writers about human origins, each working from, the, from different perspectives, but each producing amazing stories. So I will leave it uh, to our moderator to formally introduce them, but just thank you both <coughs> very much for coming. And uh, with that, I will introduce Robert Lee Holtz, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute and science writer at the Wall Street Journal, and the host of the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communication. Take it away, Lee. Professor Fagan, thank you. So, welcome all of you to the Cavalry Conversation on Science Communications. This is uh, wrapping up our spring series, and I'm particularly eager uh, to uh, dig in with our guests this evening. We have, uh, uh, under the sponsorship of the Cavalry Foundation, and the NYU Carter Institute's uh, uh, Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program uh, had a series of conversations um, this spring uh, about climate, about physics, about uh, the neuroscience of violence and genetic engineering, uh, but it's our own story that brings us uh, together this evening. From the beginning, every human culture, every religion, Every civilization has had its special story of creation. Science shapes ours. It's our narrative of human origins. And yet the science of human evolution itself is evolving so rapidly that the public is hard pressed to keep pace. I mean, really, what other field so thoroughly mixes science, sex, showmanship, religion, philosophy, ethics, health, and our species' insatiable appetite for self-knowledge. Now, this is a conversation this evening. I want to urge the people who have joined us uh, in person here at NYU to uh, ask us questions. And when you do so, uh, please seek out the microphone over on the side. And those of you who are watching us uh, online through the webcast, uh, I also ask you to join us. Uh, please do so by tweeting your questions uh, using the hashtag Cavalry Convo. Cavalry Convo. Now, I'd like to begin by introducing our two guests in a little bit more depth. Anne Gibbons, on my left here, has been a correspondent for more than a decade for Science Magazine, sort of the peer-reviewed Bible of uh, so much uh, publicly funded research. Uh, she's been uh, their specialist in reporting about evolution for at least the past decade. She's a former MIT Knight Fellow. She's taught at Carnegie Mellon University. And in a career that's taken her from field camps in Kenya to the DNA labs of Woods Hole, she's written hundreds of news stories about human origins. Um, and she is uh, the author of a remarkably uh, fine book called The First Humans, The Race to Discover Our Earliest Ancestors, and her sustained attention to this topic won her the 2012 Anthropology and Media Award from the American Anthropological Association. Now, I should tell you, for the purposes of our conversation this evening, uh, something about Anne that many of you might not know. She is, in fact, part Neanderthal, <laughs> as no doubt are many of us here in this room this evening. Um, according to 23andMe, the genetic testing service, she owes 2.9% of her DNA to ancestors from that long extinct species, uh, slightly more, uh, I believe, than her husband. 
And I lord it over him. Um, <laughs> which is a kind of species characteristic we might talk about later. Um, <laughs> Now, if you're one of the millions of people who have walked uh, through the halls of the American Museum of Natural History here in New York in recent decades, then your sense of human origins has been uh, uh, profoundly shaped by the work of our other guest this evening, Ian Tattersall, who for many years was the curator at the museum and is now a curator emeritus. For 40 years, he played the key role in developing major exhibits on evolution at the museum, including its highly acclaimed Hall of Human Biology and Evolution. As a paleoanthropologist, he's conducted fieldwork in Madagascar, the Camaro Islands, Mauritius, Borneo, Nigeria, Niger, Sudan, Yemen, Vietnam, Surinam, am I leaving one out? Uh, French oh, Guiana? Yep. Reunion? All of the above. And of course, <laughs> of course, <coughs> the United States. Um, I he's indeed. published. I have indeed. Uh, he has published over 350 scientific papers and, again, for our purposes, 21 books uh, for the general public. Most recently in 2012, I believe, uh, a book called The Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human Origins. And that, not my title, by the way. Not your title? Not my title. The you editors always win. Uh, unlike unlike uh, Anne, you have no instinct for mastery. I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's too triumphalist for my taste. Ah, I see. I see. Well, perhaps yeah. your you, perhaps yes. your DNA we is Denisovian, right. then, and not Neanderthal. <laughs> exactly. um, there you go. Let's begin um, with what is the common ground. Both of you are communicators. Mm -hmm. Both of you are are talking about uh, evolving, breaking research to the general public, but from very different perspectives and with their very different tools and techniques. Mm -hmm. So your common ground is audience. Mm -hmm. So let me begin by asking you, Anne, who is your audience? I often think my audience in the old days for newspapers was my mother, educated but not a scientist. So when I was writing about evolution or any aspect of science, what would be the story I'd be telling her? You know, it used to be the Kansas City milkman in the old days, right? That was the story for newspapers, but nobody has milkmen anymore. So my <laughs> mother, true. writing for science, I think I was thinking more that I'm writing for somebody who maybe studies a different science. When I write about DNA and RNA, I need to write about it so a physicist understands it. If I'm writing about physics, I need to write about it so a biologist understands it. I need to define the terms, need to use metaphors to make it familiar. Nobody in this age of specialization can, can stay up to speed on every area of science. So I need to make it accessible, but the fun of Science Magazine is I can get into the methods. I can get into the specialty and the depth, and I have room for that, which is fantastic. I can talk about how the science itself is changing. But then if I write for National Geographic, that's a different audience. So you're always gauging your audience. When I wrote for them, I'm writing in more visual terms. The reader there is, I'm competing with the photos. It is more about the photos. So that needs to be even more accessible. So this is what you're doing as a communicator. You're gauging what the publication is, television, what are your sound bites. So for your you purposes, your central audience is a group of specialists, a group of scientists who are um, not, in fact, <laughs> paleoanthropologists um, or large mice. They might not. not. <laughs> 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 Ian, let me, let me ask you a version of the same question. So, now, you're, yeah. uh, uh, of course, uh, yourself a, a paleoanthropologist, mm -hmm. and so this is your research specialty. Right. Um, but you're also working uh, with a museum. Mm -hmm. You are writing your books. Who do you have in mind? Who are you reaching out to? What's your mass audience? Well, you know, I've, I've been sort of desperately groping for a good answer since you posed the question <laughs> to Anne. And then I decided that probably, you know, my, my audience is me. Because I figure that if I can understand it, Pretty much anybody is going to be able uh, to, to understand it. And that is a very good place to start. Because I work in a museum where you have, to, you have to essentially cater to everybody who comes through the front door. Right? Uh, nearly everybody else, all of you other uh, you know, journalists in various fields are all sort of writing for a target audience. You really know who that audience is. But in the museum you don't. because. Anybody can walk in the door, and anybody has to be able to make sense of uh, what you're doing. And that makes working in a museum a particular, uh, particular challenge. 
There's also a very particular challenge when you're writing or you're writing a, doing an exhibition, particularly, uh, that it's going to be there for a long time, doing a permanent exhibition. Because everybody else writes to a... When I publish a book, I, I, you know, it, it has the publication date on it. Um, you know, when you write an article, it has an even more precise uh, publication date on it. And you're sort of responsible for the content of what you're writing on that date. But here, museum exhibits are hugely expensive to do. And they're not going to be redone very often. And you can't do the latest hot thing. Uh, because uh, in a permanent show, because it's most likely to be yesterday's news really rather quickly. Mm. So you really have to think in terms of what you can convey that's going to be durable and will make mm. sense to people 15 years down the road and even 30 years uh, down the road. So uh, in, in the museum context, you have a very special set of uh, uh, issues that probably most other kinds of writers don't face. So I have to ask, um, Gallup polls um, show that despite all of your hard work, uh, four in 10 Americans continue to believe that God created humans in their current form mm -hmm. uh, about 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, is nobody listening to you? It's, you sometimes do feel like you're writing for the, you're preaching to the converted. You're writing <coughs> stories for people who are already interested in evolution. However, there are certain news stories, the discovery of Homo naledi, this new fossil in the cave in South Africa, a small creature called the hobbit in mm -hmm. an island in uh, Floresiensis in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. People do hear about this stuff and you'll go to the dentist or you'll mm -hmm. go out mm -hmm. with your kids or whatever you're doing and people will ask about this new discovery and they'll remember a little of it. So those are great openings and I feel that there's a huge opportunity for us to try to, I'm a journalist first but I'm also an educator. So it's very hmm. important to teach people that evolution is a theory with a capital T. It doesn't mean that it's a half-baked idea, that it's the cornerstone of biology, that everything we know about vaccines and the evolution of viruses, this all comes from evolutionary theory and understanding it and looking for it in nature, whether it's studying the evolution of animals mm -hmm. or viruses or DNA or humans. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I have, there's a certain excitement in trying to teach this there are people who don't want to know this, that don't believe in evolution, and there's not a lot you can do to change that if they've made up their minds, the people that don't believe firmly. But there are a lot of people out there that just haven't thought about it. It's, it's what I talk, talked about with the, deep, the issue of deep time. People don't understand mm. deep time. Yeah, I was mm. going to ask you about that. Yeah. We can come to that later then. No, go ahead. But, yeah. well, here's what I've been thinking. I'm thinking, why do people not understand evolution? And I think a lot of that is that they don't understand the difference between modern humans showed up about 200,000 years ago in Africa. People that looked a lot like us, didn't act like us, but they looked a lot like us, the earliest members of Homo sapiens. The earliest members of our genus Homo showed up about two million years ago. This is when, a little before the brain started to take off. Two million versus 200,000 is a big difference. But the first members <coughs> of the human family, things that walked upright showed up six million years ago or so, or seven, somewhere in that ballpark. These numbers are like Imelda Marcos shoes. You know, these are numbers too big for most people to fathom. They don't have a sense of what they mean. And if you have a sense of how long that is, then you can understand how one creature might evolve into another creature, how it might give rise to offspring that over time, if they're separated from each other, would adapt differently to mm -hmm. different habitats. And you would get different mm -hmm. kinds of humans. Mm -hmm. You'd have as many different kinds of humans as you have different kinds of antelopes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so are, you, are you, telling me the that the, you telling me that the only problem here is that they have the wrong kind of wristwatch? <laughs> 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 that you mean that they can't keep time? That's one of the problems. I think it's also how we teach biology. I hope that you know schools need to be teaching evolution. It is fundamental. It needs to be taught not as some controversial idea, but as the fundamental cornerstone for biology. Mm -hmm. And we need to be giving real examples in the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we're working with educators to do that. As journalists, we can't make up that gap, but we can give out vivid examples. And I did write an op-ed once for the LA Times about how here's evolution in the human family. We can see it from these species that lived between mm -hmm. four and three million years ago, the Australopithecines, when you look mm -hmm. at um, 
Anamensis to Lucy species, mm -hmm. Australopithecus. You can actually see evolution in one lineage. It's amazing. It's mm -hmm. in the human family. You don't have to just look at other creatures. So, Ian, the same thing to you. You've invested a, 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 a long and energetic life as a scientist, as a mm -hmm. museum uh, educator, and as an author in uh, uh, trying to get us, trying to persuade us. Um, yeah. Are you holding uh, a flower against a stone and waiting for it to take root? Well, you know what's happening here is you know, a lot of uh, um, questions have been raised just in the one simple <coughs> uh, uh, question that you initially raised. As far as the deep time thing is concerned, I have a really kind of a neat story about that because in, my, um, in my, the, the course of my work at the American Museum, I've accompanied a lot of tours and uh, particularly tours with uh, wealthy uh, people on them. And I remember I was going around Africa with uh, a tour that included a, uh, a, a, a Chicago uh, property baron. And I was talking about human evolution in, uh, in Africa. And after, afterwards he came up to me and he said, you know, I don't know how you, you, you think in all those millions and millions and millions of years, just implying exactly the same problem that, um, uh, that Anne brought up. And I, for once, I had the perfect riposte. I said, I don't know how you guys think in all those millions and millions and millions of dollars, <laughs> right? And in fact, that's all it is. It's zeros, everything is relative. We understood about evolution long before we could ever put a year date on anything that had happened mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, in the history of life, but some things obviously happened before others. And just think about the millions of years uh, as, a, as a sort of way of placing things in time and not as numbers to be comprehended uh, for their own, their own particular importance. So that's, that's, my, that's my take on it there. I'm not worried about, about the numbers because the numbers don't mean anything. We're not numerologists. We're just paleontologists and trying to, to rank things in the order in which they, uh, they occurred. As for the question of evolution, evolution as a controversial thing, evolution as an idea that contradicts other people's received ideas, I think that the basic issue here is the way that science is taught in uh, American schools. And it tends to be taught as, a system, as an authoritarian system of knowledge. Um, you know, we, we hear phrases like, it's been scientifically proven. You know, and the, the, I, the vision of the clinician in uh, his or her white coat, you know, is, is the uh, sort of standard uh, vision of uh, objectivity and um, uh, so forth. And of course, none of that, none of that is true. Science is not an author authoritarian system of belief. It's the least authoritarian system uh, that you could imagine. Uh, religion deals in received beliefs and eternal truths mm -hmm. and that is one compartment of human knowledge um, and it deals essentially with a kind of thing that lies beyond our immediate comprehension and beyond the material mm -hmm. world that we can reach out and touch well, and you know, I gotta got jump on you now so well, I appreciate the, <clears throat> the, the wisdom and the truth of what you might be saying mm -hmm. but I also sort of feel you're passing the buck a little bit um, I mean, let's just stipulate that it all is the fault of the American school system, mm -hmm. okay? But when uh, I, as a journalist, or, mm -hmm. or Anne, as a reporter, we are not necessarily looking for authority when we're writing a story, but we are looking for something resembling certainty. And, of course, for that, we turn to people like you. So you are a, uh, uh, an agent of, uh, of, uh, who can be implicated in this, if I can put it that way. So when you were talking to the public then, mm -hmm. uh, via uh, mm -hmm. uh, Anne or via uh, uh, a more mainstream uh, journalist who doesn't have an a audience of already uh, PhD mm -hmm. uh, readers, um, do you feel like a special burden um, uh, to be um, uh, ambiguous or do you strive for certainty? <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I, when, when I hear the word certainty, I became, become extremely uh, 
uneasy, as a matter of fact. And, you know, if, if we have to delve into literature, we must. Who was it? George Morrow or whatever? Or an early 20th century English um, uh, novelist and playwright wrote, wrote a poem that ended with words something like, oh, what a dusty answer gets the soul when hot for certainties in this our life. And I think you're uh, getting, gonna get a dusty answer whether you're a scientist or anything else in, in, in human experience. Humans are experience a, a, a shifting world and they know that the world looks different depending on where you view it from. And science itself is a shifting basis of knowledge. Science is not a bunch of building blocks of knowledge that are piled up one on each other to create a structure. What it is, is a constantly modified provisional uh, statement about what we know today. And uh, what we know today, the only thing you can be certain about is that we're gonna know something else tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really think it's important to keep it in perspective. And that's why science is a supremely non-authoritarian system of uh -huh. uh, belief. So, so Anne, if I may, you're on deadline. <coughs> You've called uh, Ian. You've managed to get him uh, at a quiet moment. And he's now giving you this very nice speech about the sort of shifting nature of scientific knowledge. Um, did that do it for you? Nope. <laughs> of course, I, my job is to capture the process of science. And it's mm. a series of false starts mistakes. They're not eureka moments, right? We know it's a mm. mess. But I will push him because I need to tell a story that's clear. I'll push him to tell me what's new and what's mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. What's new is what's significant or what we're doing mm -hmm. as journalists. What's the new increment here? Mm. And that's what we'll focus on. Mm -hmm. Then what's the opposition to that? And maybe it's not two sides. Nothing's ever two sides. But what are the subtleties in opposition? That'll come in later mm -hmm. in the story, right? How is the idea evolving? But I also try to tell my science and my stories in historical mm -hmm. context. Because if you have room in a good story, you can learn more about the history of an idea and how it has mm -hmm. evolved. It tells you more about what you want to know about evolution if you could include that in there. For example, mm -hmm. knowing what the old view is of human evolution mm -hmm. helps give you a handle to talk about what the new view is, okay? Mm -hmm. So we often try to put whatever the news is in context and that mm -hmm. is a very useful tool for communicating right. science because you're absolutely right, it's a moving target. I mean, today I was walking through the new exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History here on Dinosaurs or Us, or it wasn't Dinosaurs or Us, but Dinosaurs and Birds. Mm -hmm. And I was at a meeting 20 years ago at the museum in which they announced the first feathered dinosaur. There was a guy with a Polaroid in the hallways talking about, look at this from China, dinosaur has feathers. Today the entire exhibit is about dinosaurs, birds today are really dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and the dinosaurs were all feathered. And that's a paradigm shift in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Did we cover that in incremental steps? Maybe, but no, we actually covered it when it emerged as a new idea that was controversial, and then suddenly it's the received, there's, it's, it isn't that it evolves gradually, mm -hmm. there's a shift, and suddenly this is the new, mm -hmm. there's enough data that this is the new view. So you try to capture that in your mm -hmm. story. You try yes. to tell that. And mm -hmm. you do really work on nailing down. Yep. Ian is actually very good at this. He may be talking about the messiness of science, but he's very good at being clear about what is developed. Ah. And but are, are you, are you, are you shocked to learn that? that you're clear? Ian? She I am, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. No, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, the thing is that I, it's really easy for me as a scientist, right? Is it, because I know what I think at any one time, uh, you know, most of the time uh, and on most areas, I know pretty much what I, uh, what I think and all I'm responsible for is expressing that and that's all you uh, Anne, are expressing uh, are expecting from me right on the other hand you're not just calling me you're calling half a dozen other people as well and each of them are going to give you their perspective and then you have to make sense out of this exactly. somehow for an audience that doesn't have the background knowledge either that you have or the, the, uh, the scientists you've talked to have. And that's a very different situation. It's a much easier being in my, in, in my seat, I think, than in yours. There's a lot of responsibility in it because it is a subjective lens that depends on the homework you do before you do a story, how much training you have, 
how much you're listening. These things all factor into what you present. You know this, the craft of creating the story. What are the things you're going to pick to put it together? Mm -hmm. And you want it to be balanced and fair, but what I do that's balanced and fair is going to be different than what Lee does. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting to compare different stories on the same breaking mm -hmm. news or subject to mm -hmm. see how we all treated it differently, I think. Mm -hmm. Go back to this. I'd like to take a question here. Um, yes, we have a question from Jessica Siegel on Twitter. Um, she asks, what are the most important new finds and ideas in human evolution? And especially for Anne, what is the new view of human evolution? Well, now that is an essay topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, no, because one of the reasons we're having this conversation this evening, we are uh, in the middle mm -hmm. of just an extraordinary um, uh, mm -hmm. flowering, uh, that's a nice way to put it, mm -hmm. uh, emerging chaotic uh, a view of human evolution. Yep. When I was uh, a beginning reporter, human evolution, I suspect as it was true for you, um, a, a very nice straight ladder up from the swamp of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. the primordial ooze. And now, of course, it's a very complicated <laughs> thing with 15, I mean, take a pick. So, Anne? Um, yes, I can't keep up with it. These are some of the most exciting stories out there. As science, these are some of the most, you know, stories that everybody wants to write. There has been a revolu revolution in modern human origins in the last five years alone. Mm -hmm. And that comes from ancient DNA, which has radically changed our view of modern human origins. When I first started writing about this in the late 80s, Homo Neanderthalus, the Neanderthals were thought to be ancestors to modern humans, okay? Most people thought that. Then it turned out, hey, they were in the Middle East the same time as early members of our species. Then lo and behold, with ancient DNA, it turns out our ancestors interbred with them. Not once, not twice, quite a few times. Oh, and by the way, there was another kind of human that lived in a cave in Siberia, and its people were all over Asia, but people in Africa don't have this DNA. So it's wildly exciting and interesting, but on top of it, when I first started writing about this, the thing that hasn't changed is the way people look for fossils. That's kind of the same. I mean, there are definitely advances there, but what is different are all the tools that have been brought to bear on how you interpret the data. So mm -hmm. now when you, I'm got, you want to interrupt me, go ahead, yeah. I was born to interrupt. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, no, you, you've done a nice uh, uh, overview there. But to, to honor the question, so if you were going to pick a thing yeah. um, uh, now, what is like the hot development? What is the breaking thing? The breaking thing is that we have a whole new view of, if you think about all the migrations into Europe today, this is what our past looked like. Humans had been mixing it up all the time. People have been moving and interbreeding. There were other kinds of humans. There were always lots of kind of humans on the planet until the last 15,000 years or so. The, the, this moment that there's one kind of human, this is rare in human evolution. And there were always different kinds of people around and they mixed. And what we see in the fossil record is just a fraction of what happened. That is pretty amazing to think about. So that's a huge revolution. We're also seeing exciting things happening with the beginning of our genus Homo. They weren't alone. And there were other kinds of people. They got out of Africa two million years ago. They were in the Republic of Georgia. We're seeing variation in what they look like. It's fascinating to sort of see. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also getting to the genetic level where we can see the process of evolution. We're beginning to see what are the genes we got that make us different from Neanderthals? What are the immune genes that are different? What did we, what did we inherit from them that helped us adapt to the terrain that they already lived in? This is pretty exciting, has implications for medicine today, some of the DNA we still carry with us. So, Ian, if I may, if, if you agree with this, mm -hmm. um, and you are, I believe, by trade and inclination, uh, a paleoanthropologist whose work mm -hmm. is driven by fossils, by bones mm -hmm. from the dirt, as opposed to uh, <coughs> uh, DNA uh, mm -hmm. uh, blots from the yep. black box. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you trust the picture of the past that DNA presents, and does it alter how you talk about evolution to the public? I think it has to uh, alter the way you talk about evolution to the public because everybody's heard about it and everybody wants to know about it, and so it has to be made part of the story. Whether it makes me think differently about the fossils, I'm less sure. There are basically two things that the uh, the DNA has done. First of all, it has drawn attention to the fact that species really are packages and <clears throat> like all packages have a boundary. 
but at the, ex at the, at the same time, very closely related uh, uh, species haven't diverged very much. Hmm. And you expect among closely related species a little bit of genetic interchange if the opportunity presents itself. But the ultimate question is whether the, the, uh, the identities of two interbreeding groups emerge or, or merge together or whether they, they go off on separate uh, uh, evolutionary pathways, as, for example, the Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens did, despite a little bit of Pleistocene hanky-panky, you know, was going, going on without any doubt. Um, although there are even people who would, uh, who, who, who would contest that. Uh, but it's not to be to be to be unexpected. But these two creatures uh, were on separate uh, definitely um, evolutionary trajectories, and they wound up in different places. One of them wound up extinct, and one of them wound up to be the uh, creature that we have today, which I believe to be a very bad model for understanding the past. You know, the only living model we have for our history is ourselves. But I do believe there's something very, very different about ourselves that makes us not the best model to project back into the past to understand exactly how our, um, our ancestors uh, uh, thought and, um, and uh, behaved. So <clears throat> there's clearly a lot of food for thought that has been imported from um, things like uh, 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 ancient uh, DNA studies into the way that anybody has to think about, about human history and not just the fossils. Another question here. Hi, folks. So what I wanted to know was, um, you know, you're, you're talking a lot about how the interpretations are changing and the stories are changing. Dinosaurs didn't have feathers. Now they do have feathers, that sort of thing. So how do you communicate that to the public without losing their faith in you? So you're saying, all right, you all understood it this way. Now you understand it this way. How do you keep their trust while you do that? So that's, a, I think, a pretty uh, interesting question, given how quickly um, both the geneticists mm -hmm. and the uh, more, more uh, uh, field-oriented fossil yeah. hounds have been coughing things up yeah. lately. How, how, do, how do you correct an, the record without having to sort of basically write stories saying, oh, never mind? I, I write about what the evidence was then and what the evidence is now to show what changed the researchers' minds. For example, this week I was writing about the fact that we've just discovered, we have a, a story coming out, um, that researchers have just discovered that humans actually boosted their metabolism. We have a faster metabolism than other apes. We didn't know this. This is a brand new finding. And so I talk about why they thought our metabolism Completed was the same, our resting metabolism was the same news as to chips. Me too. Exactly. <laughs> it's news to most of us on Monday morning, right? <laughs> so, but you write about what, why they thought that was. They thought it was the basal metabolic rate was the same as chimpanzees because they studied <coughs> one thing, your resting metabolic rate. What they didn't study was our total energy. And so mm. now a new technique came in and showed us more about human behavior, or how, we, how we use our energy to fuel our big brains. And so you show what the new research is. And I think most people would say, ah, oh, this is the process of science. You work with what you have. It's an incomplete picture always. And gee, here comes some new data that comes mm -hmm. and starts to change how we mm -hmm. think that adds new nuance. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love showing the process of science, that it's not mm -hmm. this black and white neat thing, you know, these Eureka moments. Mm -hmm. It's something that is a mess and it's evolving mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. get more information, you need to change your mm -hmm. views. Mm -hmm. And that should be a positive thing mm -hmm. rather than something negative. Yeah. So no, that's a good question and it's a good answer as well. I think you put <laughs> your, you. your finger on it. And, and you, you, you use the word, you know, correcting. And this is what science is. It's self-correcting. And you may introduce new errors into the process as you correct the old <laughs> um, errors, but you're hoping to iterate in slowly towards a better description of nature. And that's what science really tries to do. It tries to describe nature as accurately as it can. And the uh, more we know about nature, the more complex we recognize it is, and the more difficulties we encounter in doing an accurate uh, 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 description. But uh, somehow, scientists, you see, what, one, of the, one of the great things to me about, about being a scientist is you don't have to be right. You know, if you're a physician, <laughs> 
<laughs> is if you're a physician and you're out there uh, curing the sick, your decisions have better be accurate. You better make the right decisions. There's not a lot of room for error. If you're an engineer building a bridge, that bridge better stand up or you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult. But if you're a scientist, what you are is part of a community. And it's part of a community of people who are all keeping an eye on what everybody else is doing and not letting uh, people stray too far from, uh, uh, from what seems reasonable in the light of, uh, of, of current knowledge. And so this is a shifting basis of information that, uh, uh, that we're working with, and it does change and it does self-correct. And all I can tell you is that science, the science that I do has changed immensely in my own lifetime in the, in the, in, in the field. And it would be total hubris for me to imagine that it won't change at least as much in the next, in the next 50 years. But we will, along the way, have contributed to this constantly modifying and hopefully better description of nature that we're all contributing to. And as individuals, we don't have to be right. If we come up with an idea that everybody else jumps on and uh, tears apart, that's what science, uh, that's, that's how scientific progress works. Yes, but of course, <coughs> what we're talking about here is not just how the progress of science works, mm -hmm. but also how the progress of our uh, uh, conversation about trying to affect public understanding mm -hmm. of science affects. Now, uh, reporters, journalists like Ann and I, in that mm -hmm. regard, have a certain advantage over you because yeah. we're writing in a very short time span. So mm -hmm. um, it's quite likely that uh, they've thrown away the article that we wrote last week by the time <laughs> we are writing about the new find this week. So, yeah. But you, sir, you are a book author. You're not just uh, uh, writing peer-reviewed papers that are mm -hmm. being circulated um, to your colleagues. Your books, uh, yeah. would I be wrong to go back uh, to book number one of the 21 and, and uh, read that encapsulation of science as it existed <laughs> at the time? Or, or do, you, do you have a policy of going back and like expunging those from the record? I mean, Well, one wishes one could. I mean, any, 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 anybody who, who writes looks back on what they've written and wishes they'd done it slightly differently, I think. I mean, this is, this is just uh, the nature of things. I'm not ashamed that back in the 1960s I wrote about a, uh, I wrote a book about human evolution about which I knew very little at the time that basically described it as a, a, a gradual process of burnishing of our lineage by natural selection. And, you know, I look at it now and I say, holy moly, how could I ever have fallen for this? But nonetheless, that's how I felt at the time. And I, without starting in that place, without starting in that place, I could never have got to where I am at now. And because what I am at now is, is a, uh, is, you know, uh, Anna's used the word messy. Yeah, is a realization of quite how, how messy nature is. And in another 20 years, we'll realize it's even messier than we, the, the, than we think today. But on the other hand, you have to look at what science has, has enabled. It's enabled an understanding of a predictive understanding of how the world works that has basically underpinned all the technology that underwrites our very, very privileged uh, lifestyle today. And we couldn't have done that without basic science. I, I agree, and I think we can stipulate that science and progress mm -hmm. are doing us pretty well, but I was trying to get at the problems that you face as an author, yeah. trying to encapsulate this, this rapidly moving target, in which you've done nicely. So maybe we'll take another question here. <coughs> Well, it's still somewhat on that vein, but earlier you were talking about how we are the only living model we have to look at. Uh. So I was wondering, what are the challenges of studying our own origins and communicating about ourselves, and how do you get around those challenges? And why don't you try that? that. Mm. Why don't you try that? Well, we do look at other apes, other primates, for clues. They are not our ancestor. We came from an ape we shared with chimpanzees. Uh, so they have also evolved for six, seven million years, but they offer us a lot of clues because they took a different path. So you do look at chimpanzees and bonobos. There are whole groups of people that study other primates to get clues about who we are. We can even study evolution in rodents and other animals. There's a lot that's conserved about evolution that we can learn, how new species formed, how, 
how we respond to disease, how, you know, there's a lot that can be learned from other models. So there is something there. Mm -hmm. Human evolution, I think what we have to be careful of is assuming that the creatures in the past are not like us today. Just because they're our ancestors, they thought very differently. I mean, think about today, those of us that have grown up with Freud. You know, people weren't psychological before Freud. So we can't project onto the past. Hmm. One of the dangers of projecting onto the past that mm -hmm. humans would have behaved or acted like us. The same is also true of the fossil record. Just because we know certain ancestors, we assume others were like them. Maybe, for example, Homo naledi, this new fossil that we don't know the age of, these very little people that were found in it, people, very little hominids, members of the human family, that were found in a cave in South Africa, have an unexpected, you know, every time they find a new skeleton, it's always unexpected, the combination of traits. Nobody would ever build any of these skeletons, Lucy, Artipithecus ramatus, um, Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis. No one would predict that a human ancestor or a member of the human family would look like these combinations. So they're tremendous surprises, and that is the danger mm -hmm. and difficulty because as Ian was saying to me before this started, we're all storytellers. And as storytellers, you take what we know mm -hmm. and we project it onto the past to try to explain where we came from. And yet, the data keeps surprising us. Mm -hmm. There are always things done differently. So that's the complication, it's humbling. Nature and the past is always more complicated. And so I think we have to be careful of our stories being too simplistic. Does that stop us from telling stories? No, because that's the only way we can communicate knowledge. Mm -hmm. We have to tell stories. We have to tell myths. We have to, we have to be able to tell it in terms that we know, but be humbled and, and, and know that it's always going to be a little more complicated mm -hmm. and we'll be adding new information later. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Does that? Oh, I think that's a very good response because we are constrained by what we find and it's what we find that we have to explain. We, uh, we can start off with some grand idea of what happened in our minds and then try to fill in the details. It doesn't work like that. We have to put together this jigsaw. Uh, Alan Walker always used to talk about how, you know, human paleontology was like doing a jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box, you know? <laughs> and um, in, in a sense, it's, uh, it's, it is very much like that. Uh, there is a bigger picture out there, but uh, we only have a very, very spotty representation of, of what it was, and we have to rebuild it on the basis of what we have. And if what we have is a few teeth, and then we've got to deal with a few teeth, and it's amazing what actually can be told uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from uh, a single tooth, uh, especially nowadays with uh, many, many technologies uh, available to bring to bear. But one of our big, big problems is we really don't know how the record was packaged. Uh, we can tell a lot from a single element but we don't know what elements out there go together. I don't know if any of you have tried uh, collecting fossils at all. You know, a lot of people do like to go out on the weekends and they go to New Jersey and places and, and they, they, they collect fossils. And you know that you find mostly individual elements. You very rarely find a complete skeleton of everything. And in the human fossil record, you know, we have character a lot of units, a lot of species on the basis of cranial bits, but we don't know which body parts go with them at all. We don't have a good idea of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the whole animal. And as long as you have that, you know, you're very handicapped in, in really what you can say about what's going on at a larger, at a larger level. So we have all of these, the, these constraints, but we have to deal with the information that we've got. And yeah. that's just the, the reality of it. And of course, one of the things that you have to deal with is the community and mm -hmm. the characteristics of the community that's doing the gathering, which we'll talk about in a minute. Oh. I'd just like to take, uh, we have oh, oh. two questions here. Thank you. How are the <coughs> latest finds uh, affecting views on race which is yeah. something that is very un-PC to discuss whatsoever. Uh, I think we as science writers have been told actually not to discuss it. Um, but the, the new view of extreme diversity of separate evolutionary tracks, um, has this been something that you've looked into and what are your thoughts on sort of what's percolating? I think that's an excellent question and it's a point I think we ought to discuss. So how do ancient finds affect modern debates about race, ethnicity, nationalism, uh, just for the sake of, of anchoring the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. We've just recently seen 
the Army Corps of Engineers finally confirm uh, the, <coughs> the DNA of, a, of an, uh, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to count mm -hmm. these things, early or late uh, North American uh, yeah. is in fact belongs to uh, Native American, mm -hmm. uh, not European. And on the face of it, one would sort of think like, well, who cares? Yet, as you know, this has been the center of a mm -hmm. debate for 23 some years yeah. about um, claims of the present on the past, territorial claims, yeah. uh, claims uh, of race, of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to this? Well, there's a couple of ways to, to, to approach this. One is to point out right off the bat that race is a sort of a, a mental construct that we have. And when you actually come down mm -hmm. to uh, trying to sort people into races, you find it's impossible. That, that there's no way to, to draw, um, you know, hard, hard and fast lines among all the many different varieties of, of human beings that you see walking around in the street. We're part of a huge, a huge continuum. And the race is, is it comes from our our sort of uh, need to sort of characterize what we see around us because it makes it easier to, to, to think about it. So what the genetics are certainly telling us is that, uh, that, that, that the human species is one big mixture. And what has happened, I think, in, in human phylogeny is that in a very, very short time indeed, remember, most of our human fossil record is more than um, 100,000 years uh, old, but that all the differentiation basically within the species that we see today is an epiphenomenon of the last 100,000 years or even less in, 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 in many cases. And in those days, you know, uh, people existed in small populations that were scattered across large amounts of territory and were sort of isolated and could, uh, could acquire their own uh, uh, peculiarities mostly as random variations. But since our population has grown and populations are in contact and we're packed cheek by jowl across, across the globe, we're all members of the same species and we're all interbreeding like crazy. And um, uh, any, any signal that there might have been that would have reflected a history of isolation is uh, disappearing. And most of the fossil record is not going to tell you anything anything about this because most of the fossil record is far too old to have any relevance at all uh, to human differentiation of, 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 of Homo sapiens. And uh, it's really the, uh, the genomic uh, work that is, is helping us to sort that out. And even though, you know, there's, uh, there's a big uh, industry of, uh, of uh, what they call GWAS, you know, genome-wide association studies that need to sort their their, their samples of modern humans out into populations to make sense of what they're doing and say that this group uh, should wor worry about their blood pressure and this other group should worry about something else. Um, the main signal is, is that we're one glorious hodgepodge and, uh, and, um, and that's it. And people should, uh, should, should be more aware of that than mm -hmm. I think they are. Well, let me and ask you how this is uh uh, affected the kind of story that you tell. Now, I know um, that you just to kind of follow up on his, uh, his point about um, population genetics that you did to 23andMe testing. Uh, 23andMe, the genetic testing company, actually has a find your inner Neanderthal feature. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but that the idea that, that uh, who we are today genetically is a uh, a fossil field that can be explored, surely that changes the story you're telling. Sure, I think the ancestry stuff is fascinating and people want to know where they came from. I want to know where I came from. Where did my Scottish grandpa come from? This is, this is great. But it's not race and we need to be very clear about mm -hmm. that. You can't define race genetically. You know, dark skin is a trait for mel more melanin in people's skin. It's more, it's, it's only a couple genes and you can have people that are entirely different genetically with the same physical skin color, but they have nothing in common with each other except that their ancestors lived in a place where they had lots of ultraviolet radiation. So I write about that. I wrote about the evolution of skin color. I did a whole story on that. And it's fascinating to look at what really the evolution of skin color is about, but it has nothing to do with race. And then the other part of that that's fun to communicate is that Homo sapiens, we have less genetic diversity, everybody who lives outside of Africa, 
than any two subspecies of chimpanzees left today. There are very few chimps left on the planet, but they have much more genetic diversity than all of Homo sapiens out of Africa. And the differences we see when we look around the planet today in people out of Africa are the result of adapting to different climates, diseases, and diets. It's that simple. And I think that's fascinating, that the differences between an Aleut Eskimo and a tall, willowy Maasai warrior are about adaptation to climate. So this is the kind of thing I want to communicate because it does bring people together in some ways. It's so interesting to me that we're one very closely knit species. But then those differences there, why are they interesting too? We write about the differences not in terms of race, but in terms of adaptations. They tell us about the climates or the environments our ancestors were in. So that's interesting. And then you may write about something like in the Middle East, Palestinians and Israelis. Their ancestors separated 4,000 years ago, and yet people that are most closely related are often the ones, the ones most alike genetically who are fighting most bitterly. What do you do with that information? That's interesting to me. You know, what, what does, does it help us to understand that we came from the same ancestors? <coughs> I think it's interesting to point that out, but it doesn't mean that we get along any better. Or perhaps worse. So yes. let mm -hmm. me uh, uh, shift the conversation a little bit here from the, the, the plane we're on at the moment where we're kind of talking about the science and what it does and doesn't tell us to the community that's kind of the source of this knowledge. Um, and the paleoanthropology, paleontology community is in many ways or some key ways quite different from other scientific disciplines. It's not as well supported by public tax funding uh, historically. Um, it's more dependent on private donors. Um, and because of its origins in uh, the search for fossils uh, that are often in remote, uh, uh, inaccessible places, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was not necessarily dependent on the same uh, kind of uh, academic scholarly skill set that we're talking about now. So to, to kind of just, Ian, to use your own words, in, in, in your review of Anne's book, uh, The First Humans, um, you, you said that uh, to an outsider, um, paleoanthropology looks like, quote, a swamp of ego, paranoia, possessiveness, and intellectual mercantilism, unquote. Now, I hasten to say that you went on to say, well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> but what an iceberg. Um, so what is it about uh, uh, the search or the study of human origins that makes it such a contentious personality-driven field? And why don't I ask Anne that question? Because you, sir, are a study in <laughs> gentility and reason and are probably going to give us a logical, insane answer. So you're not the right one to ask. But Anne, you have to deal with these people. What are they like? <laughs> <laughs> it can be really tough. This is a contentious field, as is any field where there's tremendous competition for scarce resources. I would say paleoanthropologists are right up there with high energy particle physicists who have to compete on one particle detector, intense competition for data, or presidential politics, people in the White House, right? So wherever you put people together and there's tremendous competition for a scarce resource, you get the most competitive people. It selects for alpha males, okay? It just does. And I would say in Africa, the problem there is there are places that are the prime sites. You have to get permits to these fossil sites. Mm -hmm. We started with a system where a few key people controlled access, and people had to work through those people to get mm -hmm. access to those sites, and then they control it. And then on top of that, you throw in tremendous fame if you discover something, so the stakes get even higher. And it can be very cutthroat. People, some people have come into the field because they want that fame. Not everybody. There are fossil hunters that are in there. I've seen people in the field, um, I will say Mivaliki, totally in love with the fossils. That's what she lives for, is working with those fossils. I mean, there are people out there that that's what drives them. There are other people who the fame is exciting for. And so it can make it very cutthroat. There's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of fighting. There's corruption sometimes in the countries for getting permits. The, I, in my book, I wrote about one team that stole another team's site. I wrote about one fossil hunter who was thrown into jail, another one who pulled a gun on someone. I mean, this is really bad behavior. And, and I have to say, the challenge for me in writing that book was moving between teams and not upping the tensions and getting them all to talk to me. There were people that thought if I talked to one team, it meant that I 
was in opposition to them. And I was trying to move between different camps and not fan it and just tell the story. The other challenge is when you parachute into these camps and into these groups, you know, there's a lot of celebrity journalism now. There are a lot of journalists writing blogs. There are a lot of journalists calling attention to themselves. You can't be very effective if you're the personality in a camp like that. I'm their guest. They're trying to do their work. I need to go in and be low key. My point is I just want to fade out. I want to go in and observe and see how they really do their work. And that's a challenge. And you need to get to the point where people trust you enough that they forget you. And so that can be really interesting to go into camp and try to be low key, not get sick in tough conditions, not get exhausted, <laughs> be able to, you know, th these people running these camps have tremendous challenges because they're trying to work in conditions with scorpions, snakes, wild animals, incredible diseases where there are no roads. I mean, I spent days with one team negotiating with the local tribal people who had AK-47s were fighting each other and threatened us. And, you know, trying to work in that environment is really tough in keeping people well. This to me is exciting stuff though. This makes for great stories because the personalities, okay, what I'm trying to say is science is a social process. And we'll have to, if we forget that, we're in trouble. The social process of who gets access to fossil sites, who gets access to the genome data, the sequencers, to the physics detectors, this is as much part of the story mm -hmm. as the results. It sh you know, who gets access to it shapes how we interpret it. And if it's only a few white guys, that's a problem. The diversity mm -hmm. is part of the story, and we need to get that in there. Mm -hmm. So it's very challenging going in and living with these camps, but it's also an incredible privilege, and it is so interesting. I mean, these people, I think they're some of the most, you have to have tremendous energy and passion for what you do, and that's wonderful to observe. It's well, exciting. Stay with us for just a second, because it seems yeah. to me that, on the one hand, um, the, the, uh, the control of access that um, plagues the researcher um, seems to me also plagues the journalist here. Um, yeah. And it's not just that you're a fly on the wall, or, or maybe it's a good analogy, I don't know. You're eating their food. You're depending on their water. You're in a desert. You, uh, uh, you owe your day-to-day well-being and, and life to their uh, good uh, offices. Um, Absolutely. So how willing are you to bite the hand that feeds you? Well, this is really interesting and it's come up. I think this is a big question. What I try to do is I try to show their behavior. I try not to say they're behaving badly. I try to go in and be a lens like a camera and go in and record what I see. And I think by showing what I see in the camps, people then can judge for themselves what's going on. And I think that's the best journalism, the best create, you know, my book was a narrative nonfiction book and you're using fiction techniques, you're showing creating scenes and showing what you see, smells, sounds, people in action. And I think if you show it, people can make their own conclusions. So I think that's one technique that's very important. Yes, you need access. You always pay your way. You always make sure that's clear. You always write your truth for your reader. You don't write your truth to, I write what is, I always am writing for my reader. I'm not writing for my source. And that is a slippery slope. You don't want to be sucked into trying to please your source. And you have to remember that. In a way, that was almost easy because none of my sources wanted to cooperate with me at the beginning of the book. They didn't want me to write about mm -hmm. this, but then they kind of grudgingly eventually gave me access or let me come visit them in the field. So that helped in a way. I wasn't really indebted to anybody because they weren't going to help me anyway, mm -hmm. some of the yeah. most contentious ones. So, but you do have to be on guard for that because mm -hmm. you do get the permission to go in and see them, and it's natural to then befriend them when you spend hours and days and days in the field. And you have to be very careful not to get so friendly that they consider you their buddy. You have to make it clear you are, I think it's an ethical obligation to say, yes, I might be having a beer with you, Ian Tattersall, <laughs> but I'm still a journalist <laughs> with my uh -huh. recorder on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so. And you yeah. better be clear for me with me what's yeah. off the record mm -hmm. and what's on, too. So Ian, if I may, more than yeah. many fields, uh, paleoanthropology, mm -hmm. the, conversation about who we are and where we came from. I mean, as a scientific matter, it's really a public conversation. It's really conducted uh, in a lot of ways uh, uh, through the media. Um, oftentimes, scientists can't even see finds initially. They just get descriptions of them. It may be mm -hmm. a few years before they can lay mm -hmm. their own eyeballs on them. So what I'm wondering, um, so now Anne here has talked about the perils of drinking beers with you. and, <laughs> and uh, uh, or, or you know, eating eating your camp rations. 
But now I wonder, what's the flip side? I mean, uh, when uh, an interview is so fraught, because it is in fact a kind of ongoing mm. public peer review, I mean, how, how risky is it for you as a scientist to talk openly about your opinions about emerging finds? I don't think there's, uh, there's really um, an issue with that. I think that, uh, that Anne has very, very well characterized much of the dynamic that's going on there and how people develop a sense of entitlement uh, to the fossils and tend to sit on them for years and years and years mm -hmm. while uh, nobody else can get to look at them so that meanwhile their preliminary ideas as initially published get into the textbooks and it all becomes received wisdom. Very unhealthy dynamic. But that's what has been happening uh, very typically over the last few years. But I would like to, to point out there is one guy out there right now that is trying to change all that. There's this fellow Lee Berger in, uh, in South Africa who really deserves to have a sense of entitlement to any fossils he found. He worked at a place called Gladys Vale uh, near uh, Johannesburg mm -hmm. for 17 years and found two hominid teeth. He found probably half a million antelopes. We found two hominid, <laughs> two hominid teeth, and then he hit pay dirt, and he's he's hit pay dirt a couple of times over the last uh, five <clears throat> or seven years. The latest thing being this Homo naledi that has already been been uh, mentioned. This trove of of fossils, many many individuals found lying on the ground at the bottom of a crack in the rock deep in a cave system in, uh, in the South African uh, coast. And uh, this guy is throwing this stuff out there. He's, and and uh, he's, uh, he's made three-dimensional images available mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the internet so that anybody with a 3D printer can print out their own copies. And he's invited particularly young researchers to come down. He's uh, made them available to anybody that wants to see all of these fossils. And people are now criticizing him, saying that he's shooting from the hip, you know, he shouldn't have published this mm -hmm. stuff so fast because how could he have made a, uh, you know, a definitive statement about them when they were at the bottom of a hole in the ground he had to advertise for extremely uh, skinny, uh, you know, paleontologists who knew mm -hmm. how to go down uh, caves and holes in the ground and get these things out at great uh, risk to their own personal safety. Then he's being criticized for getting this stuff out in public uh, too quickly because there is, <clears throat> you know, these things have not been subjected to the mature consideration that all these other guys who've been sitting on their stuff for years and years and years have been able to give to theirs, just haven't really come out with, with, with their uh, definitive opinion yet. Anyway, so he's getting this, uh, this, this, this um, uh, criticism as a result of exactly what we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, a misunderstanding of what science is. The sooner you get that stuff out there and the sooner you get people talking about it and comparing ideas about mm -hmm. it and looking at the stuff mm -hmm. and actually examining it and comparing it to, 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 to other things, this, the, the quicker scientific progress is going to be made. The quicker this provisional system of knowledge we have about human evolution is going to, to advance mm -hmm. and take on mm -hmm. um, a, a, more, a more accurate form. I, I'm glad you brought this <clears throat> him up. I was going to ask you yeah. all about him, and I want to return to it when I let um, our, our friend Professor Fagan there answer a question. Okay. But the idea that in addition to the various technical things that are happening, that there is an open source transparency mm -hmm. revolution in progress. Yes. We'll come back to that. Dan? Thanks, Lee. Uh, one of the things that always interested me in paleoanthropology is, is what it can say, if anything, about future evolution, uh, a time mm. when selection pressures are very different in the Holocene or the Anthropocene, where, wherever we are now. Uh, and is all that just rampant speculation, or, or is there such a thing as, as informed prediction based on 
based on what the past can tell us? Hmm. You don't Are we still evolving? Are we still evolving? Well, Homo sapiens is a gigantic experiment of a kind that's never been conducted before. Um, remember that certainly over the last two million years, particularly, the lineage that gave rise to us has evolved very fast. We've come a long, long way in a relatively short time. And that naturally leads to, to the expectation that we will continue to change in the future. But I think you have to look at the demographics if you're going to say anything rational about this. We uh, evolved over the last uh, two million years in, as I've mentioned this before, in very tiny populations that were thinly spread over the ground, that were buffered by, uh, buffeted by the, ele uh, by the elements that were fragmented and recoalesced, and, um, but always in very small population sizes, and therefore with relatively unstable genomes, or rather unstable uh, gene pools, uh, in which innovations could be incorporated. And so we evolved in conditions that were ideal for fast change. Today, look at us. We are packed cheek by jowl, seven billion of us packed across the entire inhabitable um, surface of the globe. We are basically one big population. And what we know about um, the <coughs> Among, among the few things that we really know for sure about demographic necessities for evolution is that you cannot, you cannot move a, uh, a, a large population in a particular direction. It's just not going to happen. In these tiny, unstable populations, you can incorporate novelties and all bets are off. But in a very big population like this, there's just too much genetic inertia to move it anywhere. So my prediction would be that if, gen if the demographic circumstances don't change, we're not going anywhere. There'll be, you know, genes will slosh around and frequencies will change here and there and there'll be minor stuff happening at the edges, but no major innovations in human evolution short of changing the demographic circumstances, which one could easily imagine well, might happen. If I may, and then I want to ask Anne about this. Of course, if you, if you keep the filter of the uh, uh, evolutionary biology as we experienced it for much of the mm -hmm. 20th century, this is certainly true. But of course, the other thing that's uh, uh, the, pre the selection pressure here is not just demographics, but of course, the very human ability to come up with a variety mm -hmm. of clever and, and powerful genetic mm -hmm. uh, manipulation tools. Um, barely a week goes by now where I'm not being asked by my editors about this lab or that lab that's doing uh, human, gene, human mm -hmm. embryo editing um, yeah. with techniques like CRISPR, CASPR. It yeah. seems to me a predictive evolutionary biology might be a useful thing right now. But so from your standpoint, you, uh, to go with Dan's question, is it your sense as a, someone who covers this as a reporter uh, for a decade, we've stopped? We're, we're in stasis? Um, well, I think of us as still evolving. This is, the, this is the best possible me? No, I think we're still evolving. <laughs> and there are things that are still happening, <coughs> but they tend to be in the more isolated populations. So the Tibetans have genes, more and more of the population mm. have adapted recently to high altitude. Altitude is a very interesting thing to look at because traits that allow them to breathe better at high altitude are spreading to more and more members of the populations that live at those altitudes, that stay at them. Same in the Andes. This is fairly recent, this kind of evolution. However, now that we're all mixing, anything like that's going to get spread mm -hmm. out and diluted. Okay? There's going to be spreading and it's going to be harder and harder to find groups that have a trait. <coughs> Ashkenazi Jews, there's certain diseases that they've carried because they had a social system of inbreeding, right? That's not a race. This is a social system, a religion. There's certain diseases that are higher frequency. That will get diluted out as they interbreed with other people. So you're right, it's going to be harder to fix traits that are adaptive. It's going to be much harder unless a group goes off and is isolated for a very, very long period of time. And what we're seeing today is mixing, 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 mixing across continents, across all boundaries. So it's harder and harder to have an isolated group in yeah. which you can fix traits. So I think we're going to see more mixing. That will be an evolution of its own <coughs> sort. 
the mixing will mean we're more and more alike over time. I don't know if we'll become a one big group of, you know, medium light brown people. <laughs> you know, I don't know how that'll evolve. But uh, harder to have very specific adaptations that are unique mm. to one group. Well, I'm oh, please. Sorry. No, 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 just add one, no, one please, thing please. to that. Yeah, I think, but I don't think uh, there will be change, but it won't be in the genes, I don't think, unless, you know, this gigantic cultural uh, experiment that we're doing now will have some effects on that. But where we will, where, 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 it's not all over. What we're doing and what we've been doing for the last 50,000 years is we've been, we've been exploring a cultural potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. That uh, we developed relatively recently and we're still exploring and we've no idea what its limits are. You know, we've, we've gone from, uh, from the beginnings of settled agriculture through villages, through townships, through urban society to highly technological society to the electronic uh, uh, relationship phase to uh, going to uh, the, the moon and so on. We've done all of this in an incredibly short period of time. But we've done it with the same biological potential that we had at the very beginning. And we have no idea when that biological potential is going to be exhausted, if ever. This is one of the mm -hmm. things that's very cool to write about now. I just want to add this, and that is we adapted <coughs> in different environments. And today, the modern environment, one of the reasons we have so much disease is we're, our bodies cannot keep up with the kinds of changes we've made. For example, diet. The Western diet is really not great for us. Paleo diet isn't either, it's too simplistic because there were so many paleo diets, this I've written about. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's very interesting to look at the disconnect between our modern lifestyles and this body that evolved for something that was really the Stone Age, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the issues today. We're losing our wisdom teeth. We don't need those anymore. But we also, we're slow. A lot of people are having issues trying to adapt to the Western diet. It may not be the healthiest way for us to live or being so sedentary. Um, and we're encountering diseases that our ancestors didn't encounter, and there hasn't been enough time for us to deal with those. Mental illness, some of that is maladaptation to the modern mm -hmm. environment, the way we're living, the stresses we have. So it's interesting to think of this body as something that's a little bit of a Stone Age body put in a very different context. That's interesting. It doesn't mean that we are still evolving, but maybe not as quickly as our cultural changes, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a really interesting thing to mm -hmm. think about and write about. Do we have a question here? Yeah. Uh, Anne, you talked about how there's so many uh, important discoveries that have been made in the last five years, a, a real revolution. Could each of you maybe name two books each that are recent, let's say within the last uh, five years, if that's even too recent, that you think are uh, making an impact either by a scientist or uh, by journalists so that we can keep up on some of this latest? Thoughtful silence. Make an impact. Well, I, 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 I could name a couple of books that I've, that I've written, but I don't know how yeah, much. Yeah, I think, I think just for the sake of they've made. Uh, we should eliminate Chris, our own work. Yeah, that, so. Right. Chris Stringer has, has, has given his sort of, sort of overview of the field. But there's not a lot of that stuff out there, as a matter of fact. There's not a lot of easy to, to, to obtain uh, you know, resources. Mm -hmm. uh, That'll that'll help you to help you to keep up. Um, you're better off sort of reading regularly the kind of outlets that you you're writing for that you're writing for uh, that are actually give you uh, the the latest news. Uh, science News does a good job of doing this as well as uh, Science and uh, the uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Um, that's where I would be looking for for. Mm -hmm information about the latest things that are going on mm -hmm. because there is this always this attempt uh, on the part of, uh, of of the writers to sort of try to to integrate what they're reporting into a larger picture and so i think you're getting that uh, there aren't that many books that come along that are going to be that that um it depends what the topic is <clears throat> i mean it, and i i think okay if you want to do the the modern dna revolution Modern Human Origins lately, I would say two books that have been, that are current and that are interesting, slightly different perspectives would be Chris mm -hmm. Stringer's book, Lone Survivor, that's one of them, 
but the other, Sante Pabo wrote a book, and yeah. he's been mm. the key player in the revolution for using ancient DNA. Yep. It's a memoir. It's mm -hmm. a really good book to get a sense of the field of ancient DNA, where it came from, its history, mm -hmm. recent history, and changes. Um, beyond, though, that to write about the fossils, I tend to still go back to older books. You know, um, that's a little harder. Um, Carl Zimmer's written some nice overviews. They tend to be more overview books. Uh, one of my old colleagues, Roger Lewin, wrote a great book, Bones of Contention, but that mm -hmm. goes back to 1987. It's dated, but it mm -hmm. gives you some great history. I try to do that in my book. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Hall, who's here in the audience, has written some wonderful books mm -hmm. about evolution that I really like. Um, Jamie Shreve writes beautiful books about human evolution, although he, they're a little bit older at this point. He wrote some great stuff about the genome, Human Genome Project. So um, those are some of my ones that come to mind, right? And I will think of many others later that I, that I missed. Mm -hmm. Hope I'll that tweet helps. you for the list. Maybe, yeah, thank maybe you. what you two Post have it. done is uh, identified a, a, a market opportunity here <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for your 22nd book and your uh, follow-up to uh, Ian's first, books, of course. First it's humans. It's, 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 no, I said, I said we couldn't <laughs> count the but it's, a count market, your work. it's a limited but, market. Um, but I'd like to go back for a second That's to true. the example of uh, Homo Naledi oh. and, and Lee mm. Berger. And, um, you know, this clearly, uh, uh, this, for people who don't remember, um, uh, a remarkable find of, I, I don't even know if they know how many skeletons yet, but uh, uh, dozens. Um, they got, well, uh, they, they don't know how many uh, are, are down there because they've only really scratched the right, surface, literally. Right. They got 15 already. But his manner of making this public, of sharing mm -hmm. this with the general public, yeah. was very startling to the traditional uh, paleoanthropology community who mm -hmm. are in the habit of sitting on things uh, for a decade yep. um, <clears throat> for proper study. These are hard things to figure out. Uh, they need to be properly evaluated and, and then peer reviewed and then oh. published properly. And of course, Berger uh, really took advantage of social media, open mm -hmm. sourcing. People were blogging about the thing in progress. There was a sense, I think, uh, to some of us on the sidelines, that there was a worry that science felt it had lost control of the science story. Oh, I, I don't think that any, any really, any really serious scientist is going to believe that, because the 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 information, the specimens are the specimens, you know, and they're going to speak for themselves. And different people looking at them are doubtless going to uh, come up with different conclusions. And it's by comparing all those conclusions that some kind of consensus <coughs> will, be, will, will be arrived at. I mean, he's been criticized basically by people who, uh, uh, for, for shooting from the hip, you know, basically by people who've uh, been in the habit of sitting on specimens for years and years and years. For example, um, uh, they will uh, uh, publish a description and a new name in nature, right, or in science. And these are journals of very wide circulation, journals which are very, very widely read, and yet the papers are very short, uh, typically, and uh, you have a, a summary description and you have the new name, and the new name's out there, and the rest of us have to deal with it, right? But then we hear nothing, we hear nothing. We go, we travel thousands of miles to go to try to see the fossils and then send off with a flea in our ear, all sorts of things. Um, these, and meanwhile, the original, which is the original shooting from the hip thing, you know, gets into the textbooks and uh, a particular mm -hmm. idea about these specimens becomes received wisdom. Um, and then maybe 15 years later, uh, the, the monograph comes along. But by that time, people's ideas about it are already frozen because they haven't had any time to, 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 to second guess or to check mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the first thing. And then the, these guys come along and say, well, we didn't really describe the fossils. We can't let you see the fossils until they've been properly described. And after all, they've only been published in Nature, right? Circulation, God knows how many scientists see that. So well, it's been published in, it's in Nature, that's not really a publication. That's not really a publication. It's just an announcement. We just wanted to let people know. Meanwhile, you've got this, these, these names floating around, 
and nobody knows what to do with them except to uh, to accept the initial declaration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they're accusing uh, uh, Lee of shooting from the hip when he's actually been putting out three-dimensional images of these things that everybody can download, mm -hmm. and he's been allowing anybody to see the real fossils. Uh, we got a skeleton of, uh, of uh, Australopithecus sediba at the, uh, a, a cast skeleton mm -hmm. at the American Museum mm -hmm. before it had yeah. appeared um, in mm. print. This, this cannot be bad mm -hmm. because it doesn't change the nature of the evidence. <coughs> does it not necessarily change the nature of the evidence and it may speed things up for you as a scientist, but in terms of the frame of the general public knowing about these things, I mean now, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't that announcement time to sort of coincide with the debut of a television documentary? Yeah. So that in fact, news of these finds had been delayed for more than a year and a half uh, because of the exigencies of filming for this documentary, which was part of his funding package. I'm not picking on him. I'm, I'm just trying to lay out the pressures that operate on a paleoanthropologist that don't necessarily operate on someone who's doing a more well-funded tax-funded uh, operation. So what did it look like from your side? From my side, here's what it looks like. There's a continuum. Some people <coughs> over here don't share fossils, take a long, long time to study them. They have their own reasons for that. They want to make sure they have it right in their minds. So they want to do a good, careful job before they publish. But the rest of the community doesn't get the data, and there's a cost for that. On this end, you have people that get that out there immediately, but maybe the quality control isn't so good. And so there can be issues with how they control the site when they excavate the fossil that are legitimate concerns. Are you damaging it by sending in amateurs to pull it out? Are you controlling the site carefully before you contaminate it? Are bones getting broken in the process? So there has to be some nice middle ground between good quality control. Also, if the coverage is all, uh, somebody's writing a blog that's like cheerleading every time they pull it out, that's not good science journalism. I saw blogs mm -hmm. out there that were, yay, it's so great to be on the site. They got another fossil and this young woman's bringing this up. And you know, it's like cheerleading. It's like, it's, it's not careful reporting of the process. Is this, is, do we really need to rush because the cameras are rolling? Can you control the site and make sure that you're removing the fossils in a careful way so they're not being damaged? It seems to me there's some, there are some legitimate issues from the scientific community about creating a show, doing it for cameras, creating an atmosphere that almost feels more like a circus mm -hmm. versus one that's so private that people can't mm -hmm. have access to the fossils. So there's a continuum. I don't know where the right place is. I do see teams that are careful about their science, that take their time, that then they're not doing it for the media, they're not in there doing this show, but then do share their fossils and say, I want your input. There are researchers that are not the, in the two extreme camps, and that to me seems like a pretty darn good way to proceed, that do try to publish in a timely way that share access. So it's interesting to cover this. I do worry about self-promotion to the point where it, it, it colors what's being claimed for fossils as they're coming out. Um, I tend to want to cover something less if there's a tremendous amount of self-promotion going on. On the other hand, when somebody isn't sharing the fossils and isn't letting other people see them, that's not good science either. It colors their interpretations and the science suffers. People need to be able to debate and see the, the fossils. Mm -hmm. I think there was a real move in that direction and Lee Berger, my hat is off to him for sharing the fossils with young researchers mm -hmm. and sharing oh, the yeah. cast. No, absolutely. Nothing, that is fantastic trend. Mm -hmm. I think there are concerns about the way, I'm gonna say this, we've written this in science, about there, there are people I've quoted who have major concerns about the way he is conducting his investigations of those sites, the speed with which he's doing it, the way he's advertising for young tiny women to go in who are not fossil hunters. Um, you know, that, I think there are legitimate concerns there. So I think well, the process of the science, how you do it, the quality control is part of what we do write about. Well, it's a I think, I think the, the allegations of uh, incompetence or you know, hmm. you know, publicity hounding and all, and all the rest of it come from precisely the people that you'd expect to uh, to, to hear that from. I don't know I've that there is diverse, that there is a, 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 yeah. a really good argument that the uh, the fossils could be recovered in any other way than the one in which they have been recovered and. Uh, 
you know, the, 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 uh, the qualifications for actually going down this, mm -hmm. this dreadful hole in the ground um, uh, were really quite exigent. You had to be skinny. You had to be able to squeeze through a seven-inch space, if you can imagine. Can you imagine? Yeah, you had through that. I mean, literally, to get in and out of this unbelievably inaccessible and uncomfortable place, uh, you had to be of uh, that, those sort of uh, dimensions. But you also had to have caving experience. You also had to have uh, a, a BA or preferably a master's in, uh, in, in, in physical anthropology or some related form mm -hmm. and you had to know you had to know your bones and stuff mm -hmm. and he but got he a remarkably oh, large number I, of people I, I, yeah I think Anne and I would completely agree with your point mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to get at here is that the 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 uh, the new technology mm -hmm. has got a light side and a dark side and it's amazing that he would distribute 3d casts yep. worldwide mm -hmm. to anyone who's got a printer and can download it can hold mm -hmm. these things in his or her hand it's amazing that he involved women to the degree that he did which mm -hmm. has been an issue in this field um, but because of the technology of social media, mm. he was also able to kind of yeah. control oh. coverage throughout with these lovely blogs and these very enthusiastic things, mm -hmm. which make people like Ann and I, who have a professional interest in kind oh, of oh, talking to the public about it, a little uncomfortable because we're you, kept you, out. You, you, you felt excluded. This is Absolutely. interesting to me because, you know, this is a perspective on this. That I, mean, I, as a journalist. I that I don't have, but as a journalist, sure. you. I didn't feel sure. excluded. We could have been there if we wanted to be, but I didn't want to be there as a cheerleading squad. Well, I want to be there writing about the science. I want to be there writing about it in a careful way, and I want to write. If I were there, I'd be writing about the circus aspect of that excavation too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could put a gate up, you mm -hmm. could create better access in, you mm -hmm. could control the site. There are there are other things you can do. Mm -hmm. That's not for me to do. I'm not the scientist. I'm just reporting yeah. on all the views of it. Yeah, it's a, it's in a way, yeah. it's a, you're concerned about who's the gatekeeper for the science, and mm -hmm. we're concerned about who's the gatekeeper for the story. Yeah. You have right. a question right. here. Uh, yeah. um, it's actually two, and they're directed to both. I'll try to keep it brief. Okay. Uh, this happens to be the 50th anniversary of the publication of Willie Hennig's uh, theoretical book on phylogenetic systematics, and it would be interested in hearing from Ian. Uh, in insofar as how cladistics has played an important role mm -hmm. yeah. in, mm -hmm. in shaping our understanding of human evolution. Yeah. And as for Anne, uh, do you see what's going on now in terms of the turf wars between various paleoanthropologists analogous to what went on in the American West back in the late 19th century between O.C. Marsh <laughs> and Edward <laughs> Drinker Cope? Because so, that, uh, so, uh, when, when you're describing this, this is what I immediately Mm -hmm. thought of came we're, to my mind. We're getting near time, so this is going to be our last question, but I want good, pithy, short, exciting, heart-rending <laughs> answers from both of you. <coughs> all right, is, is, is it a, a sort of fossil wars situation all over again? Um, in, in a sense, it is because there are clashes of personalities. I don't think that uh, people have, uh, have, have uh, uh, you know, agents going out and blowing out each other's wagon trains of fossils. You know, the way, the way that Copa Marsh did in the good old days. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But there's a certain amount of rivalry, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's no point mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in, in denying that. And mm -hmm. personalities are involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Anne, to flip it slightly, for National Geographic, for the Discovery <coughs> Channel, for the Wall Street Journal, for Science, Nature. Is this the, we got our elbows out, are we, is this a bloodthirsty cutthroat <laughs> competition for a story? Still here? intensely competitive, not as competitive as it, as it used to be because there are many, the thing that has changed in the science is there are many more tools now to study the context in which the fossils were found. So you have many more specialists in there looking for DNA, agent botanists, people studying the environment. 50 people may be on one site, all with PhDs in different areas. And so that has brought a lot more people into this science. There are more women and more Africans running these sites, and the younger generation is not as tolerant of the turf wars. So I see a big change. I think there's actually been a real shift in the field. Mm -hmm. There's much more access. The big constraint is getting funding to do the field work. Funding is terrible in this country for evolution. We're not funding the f people to go out and look for the fossils sufficiently, yeah. and that's a problem. That's yeah. the data for which the whole field depends on. So I think it's yeah. getting better. The competition is a, isn't as bad as it used to be. Um, I think we're still hurting. There's so much more to do. 
Well, I, I just have to say in conclusion that if the kind of uh, uh, cooperation and, and uh, uh, meeting of minds that we have seen here between the two of you this evening, um, if, that's, if that's the state of the field, I want to say that, oh, country, you're in extremely good shape because <laughs> you've given us a remarkable uh, uh, tour mm -hmm. of the science and the social and journalistic implications of this new field. Um, I thank you for coming so far uh, to join us this evening. And, and Ian, I thank you for sharing and distilling the wisdom of your 350 papers and 21 <laughs> books. <laughs> and please I'll join me uh, uh, in giving them a round of applause. And please join us next fall when we resume our series of Cavalier Conversations on Science Communication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.